this is Larry Cates again from the Heritage Research Center of the High Point Public Library and today I'm recording a presentation that I gave to our local DAR chapter about documenting North Carolina Patriots for the purposes of a lineage society application. Now some important events only affect a narrow part of the population but a sea change like the American Revolution that affected everyone and it forced people many of whom were not particularly political, to make choices that they ordinarily would have avoided. Everyone was touched. After all, this was one of only three wars involving conflict on American soil, and only one of two in which a large proportion of the landmass was affected. North Carolina became a theater of operations during the last stage of the fighting. By that point, folks who were sitting on the fence had to come to terms uh, with where they stood on the war. And depending on which army was closest to them, their positions could be very different. For most average people, the important thing was the preservation of their lives and property. It was not the ideology of political self-determination or loyalty to time-tested institutions that usually swayed them. That's attested by the low number of actual combatants North Carolina contributed to the war. North Carolina sent a mere 8,000 men to the Continental Army. By contrast, Virginia, the most populous colony at the time, sent 98,000, and Massachusetts 97,000. Militia service within the state would add to those numbers, but they those, those numbers are hard to document because very few muster rolls, payrolls, and rosters survive. Uh, so we can quibble about how many people served in the militia in addition to the Continental Forces, but we have to remember that militia service was quite short term. So that means that your chances of finding a North Carolina Patriot with military service are maybe a little more constrained than they would have been had your ancestor hailed from another state. Fortunately, there are other pathways to using a North Carolina ancestor for your DAR application. You can also identify someone who took an oath of allegiance to the new state of North Carolina, a person who acted as a public official for the state or a county during the war, a person who served on a committee of correspondence or a committee of safety, a person who signed a petition recognizing the authority of the revolutionary government of North Carolina, or even someone who paid special wartime taxes to support the war effort. All of those actions are documentable proof that will get you into the DAR on a Patriot application. But many, many people actually enter the DAR using ancestors who contributed something in terms of material goods to the cause, either willingly or under duress. In this presentation, we'll start with a brief summary of North Carolina's Revolutionary War experience. And then I'll introduce you to substitute sources that may help you document the lineage back to your Revolutionary War ancestor. And finally, we'll explore those North Carolina records that prove military service or allegiance for DAR purposes. Now, I did prepare a helpful bibliography and a guide uh, to accompany this presentation. And since I'm putting this on YouTube, uh, if you're interested in getting a copy of that, you can email me at larry.cates at highpointnc.gov. And that last name is C-A-T-E-S. Um, just contact me and I'll send it to you in a PDF format. When the opportunity for independence came knocking in 1776, North Carolina had already experienced a decade of political turmoil, centering mostly on the regulation movement and controversies over parliamentary power and taxes. The royal governors, William Tryon first, and Josiah Martin afterwards, who, whose miniature you see above Tryon Palace, had a testy relationship with the legislature. There were fights between the governor and the assembly over control of the courts, 
over taxation, and over expansion or contraction of the currency. Also over enormous spending on Governor Tryon's residence at New Bern. There were divisions between the planters, merchants, and lawyers who held the reins of power in the legislature and in the county courts on the one hand, and the growing population of small farmers in the interior on the other, whose counties were larger, lacking in boroughs, and therefore in political representation. After the Battle of Alamance, many small farmers had lost faith in the governor's commitment to see that they got a fair shake. They felt victimized by Lord Granville and Henry Eustace McCullough, the remaining proprietors. Their land titles were in jeopardy in many cases because Granville's office was in disarray due to a dispute among his heirs and with McCullough. And the courts and the land offices were filled with placemen with connections in New Bern who sought only to profit from fees, quitrants, and tax collection. What's more, the back countrymen were heavily indebted to merchants, both American and British, and in danger of losing their property for debt in a currency-strapped economy. Nor did the folks in the coastal plain seem to understand threats to security in the interior from a couple of different sources both for marauding mulatto bands on the border with South Carolina, and that border was shaky at the time. It was not well um, established. So jurisdiction promoted um, illegal activity there. And then the other threat in the interior were the Cherokee in the mountains and foothills who seemed uh, willing to ally with the enemies of the British colonies. Disputes between Governor Martin, who was more sympathetic to the Piedmont, and the legislature led to Martin suspending the General Assembly session while he traveled to New York. In essence, at the very worst possible time, North Carolina was left without a functioning government. It was then the elites of the coastal plain, Martin's opposition, who took advantage of this vacuum. When the question of independence arose, they formed a committee of correspondence and then a provincial congress, which pushed aside the apparatus of royal government. After the Halifax Resolves, they formed a state constitution in 1776, which remained in effect in the state until 1835. Then, in cooperation with Virginia and South Carolina, they launched a preemptive attack on the Cherokee towns because there was a strong faction of young Cherokee interested in cooperating with the British. They coordinated with local committees of public safety in every locality to organize a militia and keep tabs on the loyalties of local people. They even imposed a loyalty oath on all office holders and later on all persons subject to being called for militia service, forcing those who wouldn't subscribe to give bond for their behavior and leave the state within six months. In some places, vocal loyalists experienced persecution and shaming. They often faced property damage and bodily harm. Why were the upper classes of eastern North Carolina so supportive of independence? Well, the wealthy were the ones to suffer most from Parliament's attempts to tax the colonies without consent beginning in the 1760s. They were the ones who could afford most goods imported from abroad, like tea, and thus had to pay the duties. They read newspapers and obtained their livelihood through legal documents, which would require stamped paper under the Stamp Act. They were the folks who paid more poll taxes because of slave ownership. Uh, land taxes were not really a factor in the colonial period. They were the ones who resented the royal governor's attempt to check their power in the legislature. And they wanted to be in control of the government and form the laws to their own liking without interference from London. They aimed to create a weak substitute for the royal governor whom they could replace every year for a maximum of three terms. Richard Caswell was the first governor of the independent state set up under the constitution, selected by the legislature to a one-year term followed by Abner Nash and Thomas Burke. And the royal, the governorship of North Carolina remains one of the weaker governor, chief executives in any state. 
based on this early constitutional bent. But they did not trust the masses, particularly the small farmers of the West, whom they had counted as enemies during the regulation just a few years prior. They did not embrace democracy, as many of us would understand it today. They wanted stringent property qualifications for voting and office holding, more so for the state senate, which replaced the old governor's council of state, and slightly less for the House of Commons. And when the British in Virginia and South Carolina offered freedom to slaves who would join their forces, the move provoked a predictable reaction among Eastern elites who feared slave insurrection more than almost anything. They were not necessarily liberty-loving outside their own circle and interests. Later, in the early days of the Republic, these elites would become Federalists. What about the Western populations of North Carolina? Well, their allegiance was very much up for grabs in the early days of the conflict. Governor Martin and later General Cornwallis were banking on support from loyal loyalists in this region. Martin had done what he could to advocate for their interest in Newburn, but when he asked them to rally to his cause from the safety of a British ship moored in the Cape Fear estuary in 1775, most were skeptical. Those who answered the call were decimated at the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge on the way to the coast. Four years later, Lord Cornwallis would probably never have ventured so far from his base in Charleston without confidence that these same Tories would flock to his standard. It was more a question of the enemy of my enemies being my friends. It's true that many Westerners resented the Carolina elites. Their interests were opposed, and while many fought for the crown, others watched very carefully the consequences of making that choice and learned how to, to navigate through treacherous shoals. Most of the actual fighting between American and British forces occurred in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic states until 1780, particularly New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York. But after a grand strategy to divide the northern colonies along the Hudson River failed at the Battle of Saratoga, the British felt stymied and humiliated. The emboldened French were suddenly entering the war on the American side. So control of Boston, Philadelphia, and New York was not enough to defeat the American cause. The British adopted a southern strategy precisely because they felt that they could exploit southern political divisions like those that I've been describing in North Carolina to enter by the back door and undermine the supply of men and materiel coming from the southern states. Luring the main Continental Army south, they could then defeat it on ground of their own choosing where loyalties were very divided, then turn north and gut the most populous colony of Virginia. An earlier attempt to take Charleston had failed, but the second time was a charm. First, the entire colony of Georgia, then Charleston, were occupied in short order. It was at the siege of Charleston in 1780 that nearly all of the Continental or regular army regiments raised in North Carolina were captured. So after that, they were out of commission. There were only 10 of these regiments originally, and they had been whittled down considerably and consolidated since that time. The 10th had never come up to full strength. The others had been decimated in the North by attrition and by soldiers returning home at the end of their enlistment periods, and so they had to be combined. That left only callow, undisciplined militia from North Carolina available to defend the home turf as the British headed inland. These North Carolina militia were blamed for many of the worst moments in the Southern Campaign, like at Camden, when they broke and ran before the British advance. On the other hand, the over-the-mountain men from Tennessee, then part of North Carolina, performed admirably at Kings Mountain and elsewhere. But at that time, Tennessee was part of North Carolina and many of its inhabitants were migrants from there. With Charleston secured and emboldened, Cornwallis decided to campaign into the back country with bases at 96 and Camden, and proceeded north into the very heart of Loyalist territory. Accompanying him was a legion of Highlanders from North Carolina. The Highlanders were recent arrivals from Scotland to North Carolina, with a bitter experience of what it meant to defy the British on their home turf in the Jacobite Wars. 
They had a language barrier. Many of them only spoke Gaelic, and they had few ties to the local population. They also wanted vengeance for their defeat at Moores Creek Bridge. If Cornwallis could gather more disaffected backwoodsmen like these to him, he felt he could sweep aside the Patriot armies and strengthen his own forces and then lead them in triumph over the rebellious cadres at the coast. What he didn't realize is that the Native Americans, the Scots-Irish, the Highland Scots, the border-free people of color, and escaped slaves that he based this strategy on were highly suspicious and fearful of one another. Many Tories also realized that once the British armies were gone from their neighborhood, they would be left exposed to vengeance from their patriot neighbors. But Cornwallis was so confident and determined that he actually destroyed his own baggage train, the rum, the tents, the tea, all the amenities his army brought along when crossing the Catawba. They put everything on a big bonfire and determined to live off the land and not to return to their bases until victory was achieved. Of course, we know that this isn't what happened. The British cause died on this campaign. The path to Yorktown led through Hillsborough, Guilford Courthouse, which was a British victory, by the way, and Wilmington. The British could not maintain the adherence of the Western peoples for several reasons. First of all, they exacted a terrible cost as they passed through the countryside. Their tactics were often brutal, and they failed to discriminate between friend and foe on all occasions. Secondly, because they had jettisoned their baggage trains, they had to live off the land and took just what they needed from the inhabitants without any prospect of compensation. Thirdly, the prospect of freed slaves in the British ranks must have unsettled many people by overturning a major aspect of the Southern social order. And finally, Tory bands in a supporting role at Ramsar's Mill, Cowpens, Kings Mountain, and Pyle's defeat on the fringe of Cornwallis's line of march consistently had the worst of it, suffering huge casualties and sometimes horrible massacres and recrimination. Cowed by defeat, many of them went home and just tried to blend in again. A great many former Tories were reconciled to their countrymen and remained in America. That's why we descend from so many of them, but not so much for the worst offenders. The immediate impact of the British passage through North Carolina from 1780 to 1782 was to disrupt local authority in a jurisdiction that was already in a state of near anarchy. Emboldened Tories became active in the PD and Cape Fear in Cornwallis's wake. Most of them were people of low estate who saw a chance to prey upon their social superiors, who were mostly supporters of independence. They hoped that the social order would be shaken to some extent, but for the time being, they were content to settle grievances that had little to do with the revolution and steal from and terrorize their neighbors. David Fanning, a former disgruntled apprentice from Johnston County, led one such group and actually captured several members of the legislature and the governor of North Carolina, Thomas Burke, during this period. Eventually, many of them were killed on the field, however, imprisoned or hanged, and some, like Fanning, followed the British to Charleston and then Florida, Canada, or Britain itself. Many former slaves also accompanied the British, and some were abandoned by them. This was the end game of the revolution in North Carolina. In the final stage, nearly everyone just wanted the conflict to end and peace to be restored. Ideology didn't matter so much. Many of them even changed their stories about which side they had joined. Some of us have received those stories as authentic tradition. But of course, those traditions are often exaggerated, and some are outright false. So how do we determine whether we connect to the men and women of the revolution? The first step, of course, is to carve out that lineal pathway generation by generation, as the DAR application form makes apparent, with names, dates, and places of birth, marriage, and death, and names and vital records information for spouses. Now, this process involves submitting to the discipline of family history. That means that you work from yourself backwards, step by step. You must also employ records of that time and place, not of a later era, such as an undocumented family history, 
or family tradition to prove each intergenerational relationship and each life event. Now, just as a, an aside, I implore you, don't waste your time searching the DAR Patriot database for an individual who bears one of the surnames of your ancestors or even those who lived in the same place as they did and then try to work forward to yourself from an established Patriot. Nine times out of ten, this method will prove that you have no direct line of descent from that person. You'll find a lot more Patriots if you simply do your genealogy in each generation backward in time and uncover as much about as many of your lineages as you can back to the Revolutionary War period. You will find a lot more opportunities for initial applications and supplementals in that manner. Also, if you take this approach, you'll certainly find more potential patriots than you will ever be able to prove. The standards are high for proving relationships in a lineage society application. Many of our ancestors left insufficient documentation of their children, even though it may be apparent through circumstantial evidence or tradition or an authored family history who those children were. A case in point is my Revolutionary War Patriot ancestor, Levi Quick. I feel absolutely certain that Levi is my ancestor. His Patriot service is not in question. He fought from South Carolina in the Continental Army, he served in Pennsylvania and New Jersey for several years. He received a bounty land warrant for his service in the Ohio Military Reserve from the federal government. Though his application for the land warrant doesn't survive due to fires in Washington in 1800 and 1814, he was quite a well-to-do figure when he died about 1802. He had over a thousand acres in Marlboro County. He left a will which names his children. The trouble is, I descend from his son, Henry Quick, named in the will and estate papers. Now, Henry was a constable. He was pretty well educated. He could sign his name, at least. But investigations into sheriff's writs to seize property for debt reveal that he was in a lot of legal jeopardy in the 1840s. That may be why he never had land in his own name, at least that we can document. All of his children were also grown before 1850, so they did not live with him in a census that records every name. Henry must have lived on his father's 1,000 acres along with his single childless brothers, Alexander and Benjamin Quick. They conveyed their 600 acres to their nephew, Mason Quick, Henry's son, in exchange for his caring for them. But Henry's other children are not documented. A court case did arise over the thousand acres in Mason's possession in the light, latter part of the 19th century. An allusion is made to some dispute over part of that tract, but there is no reference to the other parties, perhaps descended from Henry Quick's other children, who might have been disputing it. My only real proof for my connection is that my great-great-great-grandmother, Christine Quick, when a little girl was, was listed twice in the 1850 census, once with her parents, Wesley and Sarah Quick, and again, I believe, with her maternal grandparents, Henry and Francis Quick, in the 1850 census. And one of Christine's daughters, much later on, after Christine died tragically while trying to put out, a, put out a brush fire in 1874, ended up living with a cousin and her husband who were childless and adopted her. Those cousins' connection to Henry Quick's family is proven. And then there are naming practices and associations between family members and records of indebtedness and DNA matches, but nothing direct. I would never suggest that a female relative of mine try to enter the DAR on this line. It would be foolhardy until such time as documentation of all the heirs of Henry Quick is found. Now, this just goes to show that submitting indirect or circumstantial evidence will probably prove inadequate for an application to be approved. So why not focus on those lineages that are easy to prove first? There will almost certainly be some. I would suggest that you focus on male-to-male -male lineages where the families own more property, meaning there are likely to be more records, in counties where records have not been destroyed or lost. Those are your best avenues. Leave the tough stuff for later. 
when you have more experience. Expect to work long and hard on those lines and accept that in the end, they may prove impossible to solidify and prove. Finally, as you can see, Proving a lineage is hard work. It requires knowledge of records and research techniques. It requires patience and persistence to search, collate, and analyze records. Also, you kind of have to enjoy it. If you're not a natural genealogist, if it's alien and uncomfortable territory for you, my suggestion is that you hire a professional. There are possibilities all over, and you can choose people who have some reputation and skill. It's not ethical to try to get an unpaid person to do all this hard work for free. I suggest that you consult the Association of Professional Genealogists website, www.apgen.org. They have a directory of researchers that you can search by location or specialty, and they vet the people on their list. If researchers don't adhere to professional standards, that can be kicked out of the organization or sanctioned. And also, you might want to look for people who have been added to referral lists for various archives. Some people times archives keep lists of professional researchers. You might want to focus on people who have professional credentials, like certified genealogists after their name. This means they've gone through a lot of training. They have to keep up on their standards and continue their education annually. Um, and their work has been vetted by experts. I could spend a whole lifetime trying to tell you how to do your lineage research. I really need to get into the nuts and bolts of proving service and allegiance in North Carolina, so I'm going to focus less on proving relationships between generations and turn more toward finding substitutes for those pesky dates of birth, marriage, and death that you're asked to provide for each generation. The 20th century can be relatively easy, because in most places since the 19-teens, or slightly before, the states required people to register their births, marriages, and deaths. That happened through our Registers of Deeds offices here in North Carolina. The coupling of land with vital records seems a little odd. In other states, the Department of Health is often the key office for those same records. When you're working in the 18th and 19th centuries, Aside from a few places like Virginia and Kentucky, there are just no conventional birth or death certificates or registers. The registers that do exist can be very spotty and incomplete. There may be marriage registration, but not in all states. Not for Pennsylvania, New York, South Carolina, for example. Next to no civil records of marriage in those places exist prior to the 20th century. Even in a place like North Carolina, there were ways before 1868 to get married without a civil record, using the Declaration of the Bands process. Estimates are that as many as half of marriages before 1868 in North Carolina do not have a corresponding marriage bond, which is the civil record of marriage prior to that date. What do you do to prove dates in these cases? Well you turn toward substitutes. In your handout, uh, if you obtain one, I give you possibilities for each missing record. And I'll give you three examples of unusual places to find references to births, marriages, and deaths. Now, there are many options on the handout if you choose to ask for it, but I'm giving one example, concrete example, illustrated on the screen. For births, for example, here's a substitute that many people can find. Uh, this is a record from uh, an early 18-teens era uh, court ca uh, entry in Guilford County, North Carolina, where we're situated. And it shows that an Ira Portis, aged 10 years last June, was to be bound an apprentice to John Chipman until he arrives at full age. Now, this gives us his age, gives us the month when he was born, and if we compare that to when this record was recorded, we get a very good estimate of his birth date, which can serve as a substitute for a non-existent birth certificate. Marriages. This is an, an example of a marriage that actually could be used more for United Empire loyalists than for 
Revolutionary War descent, but it is a, an attestation or an affidavit given to prove the marriage of a widow of a North Carolina Tory captain, uh, Alexander McRae, who was participating in the Battle of uh, Moores Creek Bridge and left with his family after the war to New Brunswick, where he resettled in Canada. After he died in Canada, his widow wanted to get land, but she had to prove that she was married to uh, her husband in order to get it. So she wrote back to Scotland and actually got someone, uh, two people actually, who had attended her marriage to attest that it had taken place and when it had taken place in the early 1770s. And this is what she submitted along with her application for that bounty land. Um, actually, the record itself shows that the parish register in Scotland that should have recorded that marriage was never kept by the, the parson um, uh, of the Presbyterian church there. He was very negligent. And this is very common in the Highlands, by the way. There are many parish registers in the Highlands that don't begin until after 1775, sometimes not until after 1800. And here's an example of a substitute for a death record. In South Carolina before the 19-teens, there were no death certificates required. And so one thing we might turn to to replace that is an estate record. In this case, a guardianship record within an estate. Uh, one of the accounts submitted for Maggie Quick, the ward of H.S. Grant, shows that she was attended uh, and nursed during a protracted illness from June the 1st to September the 19th, 1887, and her burial expenses were paid on September the 20th. So that gives us a very good idea of precisely when she uh, died. So I just want to remind you, these are just three examples of substitutes uh, if you get the, um, the handout that I prepared to go along with this lecture, you will see a long list of potential substitutes that probably isn't anywhere complete, actually. So there are a lot of options out there. Now, on to the meaty service-related proof part of the presentation. The best way I can characterize North Carolina's documentation for revolutionary service is erratic, disorganized, and piecemeal. It's just one more reminder of the truth in the old saw that records were not created with genealogists in mind. They served other purposes entirely, and sometimes they didn't serve their original purposes very well. So let's start with the easiest and the most obvious and proceed to the more esoteric and unusual. First of all, pension applications. Immediately after the war, North Carolina and the federal government offered some relief to individuals who had died in the war and left surviving dependents or who had been disabled in service. Now these pensions required applications that detail a lot about the unit and the nature of the service and sometimes reveal a lot about relationships. Geography is usually very specific. You can often chart the migration of a soldier up to and after the revolution. With time, more people became eligible as new bits of legislation were passed to open up the pensions to more applicants. But at the beginning, it was just those who were in need and widows of veterans. Then later, all veterans or widows who had survived up to that point became eligible. Initially, only regular soldiers were eligible, but later it didn't matter whether the service was in the regular army or the Continental Army or in the militia. And the minimum term of service required became much more liberal. All that legislation is included in a timeline that is in the handout that I've been offering you repeatedly. The federal pensions have all been abstracted by Virgil White. The genealogical data is mostly included, along with some service details. His five-volume set is a good place to start. It's well indexed. But don't stop there. If you actually read the pensions in their entirety, there's a lot more detail on offer. Particularly pay attention to the witnesses called to verify service, the place and date of birth of the soldiers often given. Sometimes there are allusions to the parents of the soldier, where they lived at various times leading up to the war, 
and collateral relations involved in the conflict. The pensions are available digitally in full on Ancestry.com. And at the top you see one of Virgil White's, uh, that's a set of books there to the left, and an extract for Edward Williams, who was an uncle of mine, a captain in the Revolutionary War, who moved to Kentucky and married, um, his wife married two different times. He only had one surviving child. All that is laid out in great detail there. There are even more details of his relationship to another Colonel John Williams in the actual pension file itself that fleshes us out a bit more. So don't avoid reading the pension file itself. Don't stop at Virgil White. Go further. North Carolina State Pension Files, number 97 total, and are located in Treasurer's and Comptroller's records at the State Archives, along with a bound account book. They start in 1785, right after the war, but in 1808, 40 of those cases were transferred to federal oversight. Some of those transferred cases, the applications and the related papers, were lost in the destruction of Washington during the War of 1812. Some remained with the state. For North Carolina and other states, you should also consult Lloyd Boxtruck's book, Revolu Revolutionary War Pensions Awarded by State Governments, prior to 1814. And there's an example of another ancestor of mine, Malatiah Turner, who was a sergeant who lost his leg in the Continental Service. And because he had this catastrophic injury, he was unable to work like other men and got a disability pension right away. He applied in Chatham County in 1785. His pension was supported by the state, and then it was transferred to the federal government in 1808. Unfortunately, because of that, we don't have his original application and all the details that I would love to have about him. Um, and that's just a casualty of the War of 1812 that I have to deal with. Now, another kind of proof uh, involves land. As an inducement to join the Continental Army and stick with it for long enlistment periods, the General Assembly of our state offered soldiers who served for two years or more land in North Carolina's western territories beyond the Appalachian Mountains, in other words, in Tennessee. Now, take note that none of this land was doled out within the current boundaries of North Carolina. I can't tell you how many times people have come to me saying they their ancestor got a land grant within the current confines of North Carolina, and that was because of Revolutionary War service. That's not the case. None of that land was in North Carolina. It was all in present-day Tennessee, which became a separate state in 1796, and much of it was in a military district just northeast of Nashville. Prior to 1799, all the grant paperwork, warrants, and surveys would be located in North Carolina's Secretary of State records. After that, although the warrants were issued in North Carolina, they were filed along with the resulting surveys in Tennessee's land office. All that material has been abstracted by Dr. A. Bruce Pruitt, and it's easily available in good genealogical libraries. The amount of land that could be obtained depended on the rank of the soldier and the number of months served. So the amount can give some important details about service as to rank and duration. A common soldier received 7.8 acres for every month served, uh, up to 640 acres uh, for 84 months. Non-commissioned officers, 1,000 acres. Subalterns, that is officers below the captain level, 2,560 acres. Captains were eligible for 3,840 acres, and so on up the ranks. Most soldiers never saw their western lands. They simply signed their warrants over to other people. And this can be observed on the back of the warrant, like the first one here, from the heirs of Micaja Barrett. Uh, I'm saying Bar Barrow. And you can see that the heir, I think it's Willis Barrow, on the back side of that record in 1809 is assigning the warrant to James Pugh. And then Pugh himself assigns it to a third party uh, in the upside down portion. Uh, so their signatures or those of their heirs or agents are often there on that back side, on the endorsement side of the warrant. Uh, the warrant could have changed hands multiple times. Note that there was also a lot of fraud in this process. A massive fraud was perpetrated under the oversight of James Glasgow as Secretary of State. 
which is why Greene County is no longer called Glasgow County. People obtained warrants fraudulently for deceased soldiers, soldiers who had never applied, or soldiers with unknown heirs. This last category was supposed to go to the state university here in North Carolina, and now we're talking about some 2,000 fraudulent claims for land, which is a large proportion of the whole number of applications that were ever made for bounty land in North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Pruitt also did a book on the Glasgow uh, investigation, which looked into all the details of that fraud. Now, militiamen were not included in this bounty. Furthermore, each of the 6,554 warrants for this land will mention military service. If the one that you find does not, it's not a bounty grant. Most grants issued in both states were purchase grants, not military bounties. They are also recorded in a book of military land warrants at the state archives. There's also the prospect that people could get a federal grant, a bounty grant for their military service, in addition to the state grant. They could double dip, in other words, and most of that land was in a military district in Ohio. On the right side of the slide, the far right, is the warrant for the acreage offered Levi Quick, my ancestor, my presumed ancestor, in due to his South Carolina service in Ohio and he never occupied that land, his heirs were able to sell it after his death. As a follow-up to that last statement I made, uh, it's good to know that in the case of the federal grants, a bounty land warrant application may exist at the National Archives, which may contain proof of service and of identity. The actual warrants for the issued grants exist for all grantees and can be found in an Ancestry.com database, but here's the stickler. The application file will not exist if the federal land was granted prior to 1814. The earlier files were destroyed when the British burned Washington. Now documents offered by claimants, whether soldiers themselves or their heirs in support of their land warrant applications for the state grants, are filed in a set of papers at the archives called Secretary of State Military Papers. These are indexed in a card file in the search room, which has since been imaged and digitally posted for members on the North Carolina Genealogical Society website. Everybody mentioned in these papers, not just the claimants and the soldiers, appear in this index. From this file, for example, I learned that my ancestor, Thomas Estes, had a brother who died in continental service, but he had no wife or child. So according to the inheritance rules of the time, Thomas's children, his eldest brother's children, became the heirs of this deceased soldier, um, Moses Estes. And they made an application to the state for the land. The irony is that their father, Thomas Estes, was a notorious Tory and a follower of David Fanning, considered the worst of the Tories here in North Carolina. But he was the oldest brother and heir under colonial rules of inheritance, and therefore Thomas's children were entitled to their uncle's bounty land grant. Because Thomas Estes died in the early 1780s, they observed the inheritance laws of that time uh, in this regard. Now, North Carolina forwarded all of its muster and payrolls to the War Department in Washington as the state and federal government tried to parcel out responsibilities for war debt. These were later lost in the War of 1812, but before the records were lost, the state still needed documentation on hand to substantiate military service for land warrants and pensions. So the legislature sent Colonel Abishai Thomas to Washington in 1790-1791 to copy out all the officers and soldiers from these roles. The clerks for Thomas abstracted all the information from um, the pay and muster roles into a master list, and this remains the most comprehensive record we have of North Carolina's continental line. It often includes the soldier's name, his captain, enlistment date, 
an expected term of service, and maybe an event or two that occurred within service and whether he was a substitute. In the final report, soldiers were copied out by the first letter of the last name, and within those letters of the alphabet by regiment, ranging in numerical order from the first to the tenth. Now, there are two flaws to keep in mind, and I told you that these records were not ideal. Overall, they were incomplete, irritating, frustrating. Okay, for these roles, these registers, officers don't usually appear in the register as servicemen because they weren't listed in the muster and payrolls as such. So you have to go to another source for officers. Secondly, 30 of the muster rolls make no reference to their proper regimental designation or so, and so they were all lumped in with the 10th Regiment, which didn't come to full strength and was disbanded and redistributed among the other units. Now, William Saunders, the Secretary of State for North Carolina, later created a separate list of officers about 1884 in each of the 10 Continental Regiments, so we also have that for a supplement. If you know the captain of a soldier's company, usually obvious from the Thomas Register, you can often place him in the correct regiment, not the 10th, using Saunders' list of officers. But if the officers have common names, it becomes more difficult. The register can be found in Volume 16 of State Records of North Carolina, and the officers' list was reproduced in Hathaway's North Carolina Historical and Genealogical Register. As companies were usually raised within a certain locality, finding all the members of a single company and comparing them against later tax lists and census records may help place a soldier geographically at the time of enlistment. Even though most of those who served in the military from North Carolina were militiamen, there are very few surviving militia muster rolls in North Carolina records. Those that exist may have been reprinted in colonial and state records of North Carolina. There are a few in boxes three and seven of a series called Troop Returns in the North Carolina Military Collection at the State Archives. Boxes four, five, and six have to do with the Continental Line, and some have lists of draftees or prisoners in British custody. Some are size rolls with details of height, age, and complexion. These have mostly been digitized by the North Carolina State Archives, but they are only in indexed by the officers, the units, and maybe the counties in which these units were organized. They have not been indexed by the names of the men involved. A few other militia records, like those of Captain Hines Company in Randolph County, survived in private hands. In this case, within the Hines family in Tennessee, where they're ultimately settled, the sad truth is, if your militiaman did not apply for a pension later in life, when he became eligible, there are very few other ways in North Carolina to prove his service. When it comes to militia service, there may be traditional or anecdotal evidence in the testimony of other petitioners for pensions among surviving supporting affidavits for those pensions, or some references in legislative and governor's papers. There may be anecdotes anecdotal sources written by contemporaries or near contemporaries, such as in Reverend Eli W. Carruthers' book on the Revolutionary War in Central North Carolina called Revolutionary Incidents and Sketches of Character. So you can pay attention to those as well as potential alternative sources. For service apart from the Continental Line, that is militia service, which was much more short term, and civilian support services or requisition of material. The go-to source is really the pay vouchers and account books in the state treasurer's and comptroller's papers now at the North Carolina State Archives. The originals are retired from service but can be viewed on microfilm in the search room. In addition, the returned and canceled vouchers have been digitized and indexed on family search. Basically, the vouchers or IOUs that the state's representatives gave to individuals when they could not pay for goods and services immediately, which, in other words, was most of the time. Financial condition of the new state was obviously very shaky. Most soldiers or militiamen were paid in three ways, initially with a small immediate cash advance, then with an order for additional cash within a few months, and finally, the balance, a far greater amount, in a voucher or IOU for the remainder 
that could be held over the years and then redeemed to pay taxes or fees for land grants or even used as currency locally to neighbors who wanted them for those purposes. The same for anyone providing goods or services to the armed forces. The folks who held these claims took them to fiscal district auditors to have them validated and the auditors would then issue the final voucher. Each district was composed of several counties, roughly corresponding to the superior court districts of the time. Guilford was in Salisbury District, and Randolph County was in Hillsborough District, for example. And there's a map in the handout that shows where these districts' boundaries actually lay. The auditors also kept account books as they issued the vouchers, which exist in four series. Now, these books are a mess. There's no overarching structure to them. Some are duplicates of others. Some have to do with adjustments to the voucher system, as in revaluation and reissue, ordered by the legislature, or final settlements with federal auditors. Some of them are specifically military-related. Each page within them consists of multiple leaves or folios. Most of the time, it's not possible to determine whether the voucher was issued for military service or for civilian goods or services. Because the auditors presided over wide districts, and even later a statewide board was appointed to cover claims within a specific period, it's often difficult to determine where the claimant even lived. But there are exceptions. Wynette Hahn transcribed and indexed, bless her heart, all the account books in a long series of volumes. Good genealogical libraries in North Carolina have this set. There are certainly more entries in the account books than there are surviving loose pieces of paper, those vouchers. And also, as you can see in these examples, when they were redeemed, the vouchers or certificates were canceled with a penny-sized hole which sometimes obscures to whom they were even issued, or for what sum. Many of the original vouchers have been lost or were never redeemed. About 500,000 original vouchers have been preserved, and they are alphabetically filed at the North Carolina State Archives. As I said before, they have been indexed and digitized on Family Search, so they are easy to access these days, uh, barring any misreading of the names in the indexing process. The entire set of records, including the vagaries of each account book, are described very nicely by George Stevenson in his excellent chapter on military records in Helen Leary's North Carolina Research. In, in this case, you see my ancestor, um, Colin McRae, being allowed money, 42 pounds and some odd shillings and eightpence, specie for some kind of service that he provided the state. Uh, I know it's my ancestor because the name is pretty uncommon, and also because of the auditor's names. The auditors were in the district that covered the area in which he lived, and he was practically the only adult Colin McRae there at the time. And in fact, I have a tradition in the family that states that he kept a military commissary near the Petey River, near his home, just southwest of Mount Gilead. Now, one more thing to consider about the vouchers before we move on is that you can attach a voucher to a particular ancestor, um, but that doesn't really necessarily indicate what that ancestor's sympathies were during the war, because let's just think about it. If a requisition officer came through and took your ancestor's horse, leaving him with an IOU, he might not have been very pleased about that. He might not even have been uh, very interested in supporting the state government. He didn't have a choice in the matter. And the petitions to the legislature reveal that many North Carolinians felt victimized in this way by both sides. Now, in an effort to determine its share of war debt vis-a-vis -vis the new federal government, North Carolina tried to adjudicate all wartime claims against it. Its proportion of responsibility was calibrated according to the value of its lands in relation to those of the whole country. Part of that process involved reaching settlements with individual claimants, which was partially accomplished through commissioners and auditors recording debts in the account books that we've just been talking about. But there are also surviving loose papers submitted by some claimants gathered into files by the claimants' names. In these limited cases from the treasurer's and comptroller's papers, we get a much better sense of what the vouchers were issued to cover. The claimant's residence may be identified, 
If the claimant died before the claim was settled, you might get a sense of when they died and who their heirs and representatives were. A list of these claimants and with files of loose papers was published in William Perry Johnson's Old North Carolina Genealogist in 1960 and 1961, and the actual contents were abstracted by Ransom and Janet McBride as Revolutionary War service records and settlements over more than 20 issues of the North Carolina Genealogical Journal. In addition to receiving applications for bounty land, which are documentable in other ways that we've already discussed, the General Assembly received petitions from people affected by the war. They came from widows and orphans of soldiers, from disabled and impoverished veterans, and from people who had lost their auditor-issued vouchers or their bounty land warrants, or were who, victim, who were victims of fraud, like the Glasgow land fraud that we were talking about earlier. Mary Bell Delamar, located and described these from the 1778 to the 1833 sessions of the legislature, and a copy of her typescript was placed in the archive search room. Later, her work was published serially in the North Carolina Genealogical Society Journal, but in the last few years, they were collected and republished as a separate book. I can attest, however, that Miss Delamar did miss some things. So there are other references in the legislative papers that she didn't quite get, and she didn't quite get to include in her transcriptions. The post-1833 revolutionary claims before the legislature were abstracted by Ransom and Janet McBride as Revolutionary War claims in the North Carolina legislature after 1833 in two issues of the North Carolina Genealogical Society Journal from 1992. Here's an example of one of the Delamar transcripts for a very famous officer, Colonel Arthur Faubus, who served from Guilford County here at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse uh, for his widow. This is uh, her claim to the General Assembly as she wasn't doing very well after the war uh, and he died of his wounds. She was left to care for herself. If your ancestor did not fight, but served in other capacities, or clearly aligned himself or herself on the Patriot side, how do you prove that? Well, the clearest way is through those vouchers or indented certificates that we were talking about. Though remember that though admissible to the DAR, they may not reflect your ancestors' true attitudes toward the war or to the parties involved. Just that she or he had produce or stock or goods commandeered by the Patriots. Vouchers were also created in Virginia, there they are called public claims, and South Carolina, and information about them has also been published. Any certificate you can link to your ancestor is a clear pathway into DAR membership. The problem here in North Carolina is determining which person of a given name is the same as your ancestor. That can only be done by the district in which the claim was filed. Potentially, and also any associated person, that you can find through the account books, as in someone who was deputized to collect the voucher for the claimant, or someone to whom the claimant assigned his certificate later as a kind of currency to pay for our debt or something. That person might be a near neighbor and give you a good indication of exactly which John Smith we're talking about on, on the original voucher. Another possibility would be the records of the committees of public safety and correspondence in the state. Some material does survive from those committees at the state archives. The committees were mostly located down in the eastern part of the state, or the records relating to county officials, you could use those who served during the Revolutionary War, particularly after the legislature acted to align itself with the rebellion. That information is found in the minutes and papers of the county courts. Minutes for many counties have been transcribed and indexed and will lead you directly to the original records. Descent from practically any level of official serving his county and clearly any statewide office holder during wartime will put you in a position to join the DAR. And then there are those petitioning the state legislature or the governor and thereby recognizing the authority of the new state during the war. Religious petitions, however, are not admissible according to DAR rules. Many of these were abstracted by me and the North Carolina Genealogical Journal from 2012 to 2015. Many have been digitized by the North Carolina 
the State Archives digital project. Some petitions demonstrating loyalty might also be found in district superior court records of North Carolina from this period at the State Archives. Here's an example from my uh, ab abstraction of legislative petitions from 1779 of a group of New Hanover County residents who are petitioning the legislature that Governor, uh, rather General Lillington's forces be kept in their vicinity to protect them from the depredations of British shipping and to keep the local Tories in subjection, also to protect the local salt works. And all those names of those people clearly show that they were on the Patriot side during, during the war and were seeking help from um, the state legislature in their defense. So I hope with these tools in hand, you can now systematically check the major sources for evidence of your ancestors' service and affiliations in North Carolina during the Revolutionary War. But I want to say, in conclusion, I want to advise you not to be shocked or surprised if you find some ancestors who have no clear affiliation and others who at one time or another affiliated with the Loyalists. I would encourage you not to be too judgmental of, about that. After all, according to John Adams, the Loyalists and the neutral population encompassed about two-thirds of the inhabitants of the British colonies at that time. Might have been even higher in the South. When you find the answers, take a step back and consider for a moment what you might have done in a period of upheaval when your property and family were under imminent threat, when armies were passing through your neighborhood. Be careful not to judge too harshly or to lionize too much. Some Revolutionary War ancestors on either side were truly heroic, and they made enormous sacrifices for their beliefs. But many of them were just seeking to survive. How many of us would have taken the heroic path? How many of us would have chosen survival? As Thomas Paine wrote, these are the times that try men's souls. I pray that we never have to demonstrate where we would fall along that line.